Hey everybody, um, here's uh, a new tutorial for the material we covered in class today. Um, I decided to do the tutorial a little bit earlier so that you'd have as much time as possible to work on this uh, stuff over the course of the week. Um, pretty much uh, I, I went over more information about a lot of objects that we already know and have used. Plus we added a couple new objects. Uh, we briefly discussed the K slider object. Um, we didn't talk uh, that much about it. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to add two more objects, the MTOF object, which is almost always connected uh, directly to the left inlet of the K slider. The cycle tilde, which we've seen before to use as a test tone, but we haven't seen it before as a sonic or musical generator. And then the waveform tilde object that we talked about today. So let's start with the buffer groove pair. which uh, you should be getting pretty familiar with at this point. Um, our buffer groove pair allows us to read a sample into a buffer. Double click that buffer to see the sample in the buffer and then play that sample from the groove by supplying a starting point as an integer and a speed as a signal. And we're able to play that sample. And also, of course, with a at Rui, we can find the turn on looping attribute, turn that on. And we have a little sample player here. Uh, so the thing that we added to this today, well, we added a couple of things. Um, first of all, we looked at the fact, again, that we can use a number tilde to see our position within the loop in percentage. Um, and uh, also, I showed this briefly in class. I'll show it to you in a little bit more detail. We used a dial from the right outlet of number tilde so that we could see it in a, in a graphical representation. I had to make some changes in the inspector to this dial in order to uh, show us what we wanted. Uh, let's see here. I had to change the dial to float output, toggles floating point output from the dial object, okay. And I had to set its uh, range to one, meaning from zero to one. And so now we get a graphical representation of where we are in the loop. We can make it a little thicker. Oh, that's interesting. So I can uh, also, I didn't know this, I could change the degrees used in my circle to 360 and my circle width percent to 100 to make it a little thicker. And that'll give me a nicer graphic here. Oh, great. I really like that. Um, so we also added the wave form tilde object. And the waveform tilde object is one of those graphical objects and it takes a couple of messages. Uh, first of all, it takes the set message, which is how we, excuse me, that's an object, message, the set message, which uh, is how we connect it to a named buffer. So we say set name. And of course that message doesn't go to the buffer yet. We have to lock our patch, click the message, and that sends the message down the patch cable to the object. And now this waveform object is uh, connected to this buffer. And this groove is also connected to this buffer. So we no longer need to double click and look inside this window to see the waveform. We can actually see it right here. The other message that it takes that's quite useful is the, um, is the mode message. And there's a couple modes. Um, there's uh, mode select, 
which when we send it mode select, it allows us to select a portion of the waveform. And that's the only mode we looked at in class today. Let's look at one other mode right now, which is mode loop, which allows us to drag our selection around without changing the size. Now what this is good for is it generates a couple of useful values um, out of the second and third outlets. And these are the loop start and loop end. So in mode select, I click here and drag, and it shows me this yellow section starts at 454 milliseconds, ends at 812 milliseconds. If I shift, click, and drag, I can drag it all the way to the beginning. Starts at 0 milliseconds, ends at 812 milliseconds. Um, now, what's difficult is if I go in mode select, I'm in mode select. If I go in mode loop, I'm in mode loop. They look the same, right? I don't know which mode I'm in. So I'm going to show you a trick uh, that will come in handy later in your Max work. Uh, I'm going to create a new message box and use the right inlet of that message box. We've done this with number boxes, but we've never done it message to message before. I'm going to use the right inlet of the message box to show me what mode I'm in. So when I click mode select, not only will I change the mode of the actual device, I'm also going to change this method, me message box to show me that I'm in mode select. See? And now I'm in mode loop. So this is my status display, basically, that I've created. Um, so let's uh, make it look less like a message box. It'd be nice to make it look like a comment. That's easy to do. You click on it, you open up the inspector, you take its background color down to transparent. And since all of these objects have a gradient background color, you also have to take its bottom background color down to transparent if you want a totally transparent background. Now, then obviously the text disappears, so we go to text color and makes the text color black. And now we have something that looks like a comment, but it's actually a message box that's telling us what mode we're in, either mode select or mode loop. So what do we do with these numbers? There's lots of stuff that we can do with these numbers. The more obvious thing that we can do with these numbers is use the second and third inlets of Groove to set our loop points. But before we do that, I want to take a less obvious uh, use and, and explore it. Which is, I can See, ordinarily, we've been putting zeros in these number boxes because the only point we knew about to start a sound was zero. But now we know how long a sample is. Right? This sample is 1,846 milliseconds long. And so, for instance, we know exactly where halfway is. It's 923 milliseconds. So now we know something like 923 will allow us to start right in the middle of the sound. So we can start at the beginning of the sound, or we can start right in the middle. Beginning or the middle. And in addition, we can identify all sorts of other start points within the sound. For instance, we could start the sound here, which is 230 milliseconds. So I can make myself a 230 button. And I can make a selection that starts here. That's 460 milliseconds. Now some of you who are familiar with musical genres are going to uh, begin to hear this as sounding familiar. And in fact, this is how breakbeat music, this is actually what breakbeat means. We're taking the beat and breaking it up um, by finding, by identifying start points within the beat. Uh, so we can continue to do that if we want to. That looks like it's kind of probably going to be 560 milliseconds. And each of these now is a different break in the beat. And I think you can probably see that we could hook this up to a sequencer and deal with this drum loop really not as a loop at all, but as a bunch of individual samples that all happen to be stored in the same audio file.
So that's one use. And then, of course, there's the direct use, which is to connect these to the second and third inlets of Groove, turn on looping. And now we're literally controlling a loop. If I highlight that and start the sound at the beginning, it just plays that portion. So it becomes a very playable, very malleable uh, sound tool. So that's one of the reasons why I like waveform a lot. Um, and I like uh, not only using waveform to identify millisecond points within the beat, but also to uh, select sections of the loop. Um, so that's great. We will uh, close that discussion of buffer and groove and move on. So next we looked a bit more at Metro and Toggle. And uh, we looked, uh, first of all, at the nature of Toggle itself. What is Toggle? Um, well, Toggle is uh, as we discovered, a Boolean operator. So if we hook a number box up to Toggle, we'll see that when we click Toggle, it creates a 1. And when we uncheck Toggle, it sends a 0. Uh, so this turns on and off Metro. We knew that before, but now we can actually use the output of the Toggle to control other things. I'm going to put a value into this Metro, uh, 250 milliseconds. Um, so for instance, I could hook a Select. up to the toggle through the number box, and I can use it to control anything. When, I, when the toggle is checked, that button is pressed. When the toggle is unchecked, that button is pressed. When the toggle generates a one, the one passes through the number box, goes into the select. When select sees a one, it bangs the left outlet. When I uncheck the toggle, a zero passes through the number box into the select. When select sees a zero, it bangs the, the second outlet. And if it saw anything else, it would dump that out the right outlet, but Toggle is not capable of creating anything else. So here we have a great way of turning things on and off using the Toggle. Also, since we've been using line tilde to control the speed of our grooves, we can also use our toggle to pause sound. In fact, we can use, it, we can use the same toggle. So for instance, some people had a drone playing, and they wanted the drone to stop when their master metronome stopped this will do that because when we turn off the toggle it'll send a zero to the line tilde and if we put a number tilde here we can actually see this toggle on speed is one toggle off speed is zero or paused so this will stop any looping sound at the same time that it stops the metronome so let's look at the metronome itself the metronome itself takes a typed in argument which is, uh, as we've talked about, the metronome is a button that presses itself uh, every so often. It's the equivalent of the timer uh, object in Game Salad. In, in Game Salad, we would have said every one second we want something to happen. Here in Max, we'd say Metro 1000. It means the same thing. Every one second, press the button. But what we haven't been able to do up until now is change the speed. But as we'll discover in Max, a lot of objects use their right inlet to change their stored value. 
So if I type in 50 here, now it's every 50 milliseconds very fast. If I type in 500 and hit return, now it's twice a second. If I type in 3000, hit return, it's every three seconds. And of course I can get this number from wherever I want. For instance, I could do random 3000. A button up to that. Now every time I hit this button, a random number between 0 and 2999 is generated, and that becomes the speed of the metronome. So now it's every 2.113 seconds the metro is going to tick. I click the random again, now it's every 1.605 seconds the metronome is going to tick. So this right inlet becomes a very powerful tool for us. We didn't look at anything additional on the counter object. We didn't look at anything additional on the select object. We just reviewed the random object in there, uh, so I'll leave these be. Um, we already looked at the at Rui object again in the buffer groove section, and uh, the patcher as well. So the next thing we talked about at some length was delay, because people don't really understand the usefulness of delay. and. Uh, Delay is a, is, a, is a wonderfully useful tool, but it's useful in so many different scenarios, it's hard to know when to use it. So let's take a look at some examples. Right, so what delay does is it delays a button press. So when I click this button, the delay will delay the pressing of this button by one second. Watch. Click, click. Right? Delayed by one second. And if I want to create a sequence, I could, for instance, delay the pressing of this button by two seconds and delay the pressing of this button by three seconds. One, two, three. So this can be musically useful, as we looked at in class. We could have a new buffer here. The old Fender Rhodes sample is in my buffer. Hook the groove up to the speaker. and have a couple of grooves to play a couple versions of this sound at different speeds. So there's one, here's another one, and there's another one. One at normal speed, double speed, triple speed. So this is one use of delay would be to create echoes, uh, or in this case, not technically echoes, but different events happening spaced out in time. And it's, it's distorting or overmodulating a little bit because we put a meter here, 
to see to see what sound level is being generated, we'll see it uh, it hits the red. And that's what that distortion uh, is. So we can just take all of this and put it through a volume slider, a gain tilde. Nice, nice big volume slider. Take the output of that. And remember, we can mix sounds just by sending them to the same inlet. So we're, t we're taking all three sounds, we're mixing them at the inlet of this gain slider, and then we are sending that whole mix out to uh, the meter and the speakers. And we know that a value of 127 sets us to unity gain, so let's just go lower than unity gain, and now we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't clip anymore. And I can also make one with no delay. This is going to be really low, playing that at half speed. Too low to hear, actually. I'll make it really high then. Another way to do the same thing would be to use all delay 1000s here and have one delay feed the next delay. Same thing. It just means the but the bang goes through this delay, gets delayed a second, then goes into this delay, gets delayed another second, and goes to that delay. The nice thing about this is I could connect a single number box to all three delays and change all three delay times. Just as we can with the metronome, we can change the delay by controlling its right inlet. This is getting a little messy, so I'm going to use segmented patch chords to draw this a bit more clearly. And if you want, you can also use coloration. Um, control clicking here. Oh, sorry. Got to, um, option clicking and dragging to select the patch chords, and then control clicking to change their color. And I'll just pick a color for those chords. That's a, that's a way to, to make things a little bit easier to see. So if I change this to 200 milliseconds, or 400 milliseconds, I'm getting a little bit of a pop there. Possibly because they're restarting before they finish. Let them fade all the way out. And now try it again. Yes, that's it. This is a pretty long sample. See how long a sample that is. Oh yeah, that's actually an extremely long sample. That's a 20 second long sample. I didn't realize that. So in order to let them fade all the way out, they'd actually have to go to uh, all the way to 20 seconds, which actually leads us to uh, a, a very important use of another object, which is the uh, the function object. Uh, let's see if we're ready for the function object. We can use it right here. Let's see, we're talking about delay right now. Uh, multiply tilde, we'll talk about, yeah, we'll talk about that in conjunction with the function object. So let's go to that right now. Um, so I'm going to copy this by option click and drag and say that this is delay plus function. And this is going to be a different use of the f of the function object than I showed in class, uh, but it's uh, the same, you know, it's it's the same concept and hopefully showing it in a different context will help you understand it better. Let's go in here. So the problem I'm facing, the problem I need to solve, and this is often how you end up 
learning things in Max and really in any multimedia environment. You end up learning stuff because you've got a problem you need to solve. So the problem we need to solve, let's clarify what that is. I'm going to set this around 100. The problem we need to solve is these samples are really long. They're much longer than we thought. They're like 20, 20, 24 second long sample. So if I restart this before 24 seconds has elapsed, I'm going to interrupt the playing of the sample and possibly get a click like this. Now listen. Hear, that? hear those clicks? Maybe you can't hear them on your recording, but I'm definitely getting clicks because uh, I haven't let the whole 20 seconds elapse yet. What I need is I need an amplitude envelope. I need a volume envelope. Uh, so let's make one. So set domain. Set domain instructs this envelope how long, how much time there is from beginning to end of the visible window. So if I say 1000 and click it, I've set this to be one second long. And now I no longer need this set domain. Maybe I'll need it later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it over here. But I have set the domain and now forever this object is locked to that domain. So how do I then control these so that the volume will fade out without having to go the entire 20 seconds of the sample. Well, as we talked about in class, volume control is multiplication. So I can use this envelope to generate a line that I will multiply with the sound itself to create a volume envelope. And it's a simple envelope. We just want it to fade out in a second instead of fading out over 24 seconds. I'm taking all the delays out and we'll just listen to this one right now. So you might not hear the difference, but here it is without the envelope. sound just goes on and on and on. It actually takes 24 seconds to fully fade out. But by adding this envelope, I'm fading from full volume down to zero volume. In fact, I can even go like that by shift clicking that or remove that point. From full volume down to zero volume in one second. Why one second? Because I set my domain to one second. Set domain one second takes one second to fade out. If I want it longer, I can set them into two seconds. Click it. It takes longer to fade out. I can make two set domain buttons so I can switch back and forth between them. There's my one second domain. There's my two second domain. So what I want is I want to create an envelope for each one of these. And it doesn't need to be this big. I can actually shrink it way down. And add it here at a location that makes sense. It's going to disconnect this set domain for the moment. And I'll give each one its own envelope. So I'm taking the sound output of each one of these notes. And giving it its own fade out. And the button is going to need to trigger the envelope in each case.
And instead of actually, I have one that I like, so I'm just going to delete all of these and just duplicate the one that I already like. Using option, click, and drag. And it was that's slightly different than what I had before, but it's okay. Connect all those outputs to the master fader and connect my delay lines back in. Ah, right, and I need to trigger each envelope. And also, I need to set domain of each envelope, and I can set them all with a single message. Take this one message, send it to all four of my envelopes, and set all their domains. Bam! I set all four of them with one click. And here's another way to create a, a loop in Max, uh, which would be to then take my final output and send it back to my input. This is a feedback loop, but it's an intentional feedback loop. Once I start this, it'll go forever. and I can change the speed. So now, because I'm at 250 milliseconds, my domain isn't short enough. And now the clicking is gone. I'm fading these out quickly enough. I'll show you one more thing related to this. See, this is crazy, right? I have two domains I want to switch between, and I have to make eight patch cables. It's not really true. Um, I can actually put a changeable argument into a message box, which we do by saying dollar sign one. make this a little larger so that you can see what I'm doing. I did set domain dollar sign one. Now it's a little bit odd. What does this dollar sign one mean? This dollar sign one is what we call a changeable argument. Uh, so the changeable argument I can take a number box and send it in and whatever number I put in here like 1,000, this becomes set domain 1,000, and that gets sent to all four. And if I want to change it, I can just change it with the number box. Set domain 205 and you can hear the difference set domain 100 now it's only taking a hundred milliseconds to fade out
So you can see how much I can change the quality of those sounds um, by changing both the domain and by editing the, uh, the envelope in the function object. And I, and I was able to dynamically change the domain by using set domain dollar sign one, which just allows me to use a number box to set the domain to whatever I want, or multiple message boxes. So if I want to be able to set the domain to 1,000, 2,000, or 500, I can freely switch between them. That's set domain 500, set domain 1,000, set domain 2,000. The dollar sign one gets replaced with whatever number comes in. And this is a very handy way to not have to create lots of message boxes with the word set domain in them and lots of patch cords leading to all these. Just three messages that become buttons so I can set three different domain values and also uh, certainly an integer number box to set any domain value that I want.